So when you get your count, uh, let me know. And if you're, you are viable, then pick up your cards and uh, deliver them up here to our secretary. And again, this is the time to fill out the first side of your preference card. If you've completed your count, please have the precinct captain come up here and give us your numbers. If you've completed your count, please come up and uh, give the caucus secretary your number.
Okay, a few more minutes and let's get those uh, counts in, please.
right, uh, has everybody submitted their numbers for the first round? I think we have every, uh, every candidate, but I just want to make sure we, we don't miss anybody. All right, going once, twice, okay. All right, we'll, we'll put up the numbers here in just a second. Klobuchar, 97, Sanders, 207, Steyer, 2, Warren, 138, Yang, 55, and uncommitted, 4. And so 91 is the viability threshold, is that right, Madam Secretary? 91, so you'll go through and put who's viable on that, that list there, on status. Okay, the, those in the viable preference group, those in the viable preference group uh, may, you, you could probably leave without a lot of consequence. However, later in the process, we will need to elect delegates to your group so that you may want to have some people stick around for that delegate election. The second alignment will last in the range of 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, I guess without objection, it seems like we've solidified. Would uh, 20 minutes uh, be enough, or would you feel that longer is necessary? 15 minutes? 20? I'll go with 20 with my first one. Just to be, uh, we will be looking at the number, those numbers up there, we'll be counting the cards of the viable groups that we've received, and I don't know if those numbers will adjust or not, but they, they might slightly, but I don't, they're not going to affect the viability threshold. Uh, hold on a minute, and we'll give you a start time for our 20 minutes.
that's okay. <laughs> but we still got people uh, talking.
penalty. That's my biggest thing. No, it's definitely not. Like, wants to give you a union. But my, but, but think about it like this. My biggest thing is UBI. Federal job guarantee is pretty much direct. So the main oppositional running point to me would be Bernie's, oh, sorry, Bernie's position in that, in that same facet, right? I, I completely disagree with federal jobs guarantee fundamentally. The, the, I mean, the idea is that you got to people, the American dream, people don't want to work for the government for a minimum wage job to support themselves. They want the ability and the opportunity to apply for themselves.
So I'm Rachel Stassenberger, the politics editor of the Des Moines Register, here with Brianne Fonensteel, our chief politics reporter. We still don't have very many results in. Last I checked, we had 1.8% of all the precincts uh, that were calculated, but they didn't even have the delegates. They only had first and second alignments. So rather than tell you about the results, which we are anxiously waiting for, Brianne just came up from a caucus site. What was it like down there? So I, I joked that it's the most convenient caucus site in the state because it was in the lobby of our building downstairs. But they had about 850 people who showed up. That was about 200 more than they've had in the past. We've had a lot of new growth in this area. So it's a lot of young professionals, a lot of um, retirees who are living downtown for the first time. And on the first alignment, um, it was only Bernie Sanders, Pete Buttigieg, and Elizabeth Warren who were viable. And so then there was a second realignment phase where they were competing to bring over the Andrew Yang supporters and the Amy Klobuchar supporters. And so we were watching from above as these groups were kind of forming and as they were pulling people toward them. And then on the second alignment, Pete Buttigieg really, really rose. And so he ended up getting five delegates out of this precinct. Wow. Bernie Sanders got five delegates out of this precinct and Elizabeth Warren got four. And so we're seeing these play out across the state right now. And that's what we see is a lot of gamesmanship. So after that first alignment, the first time people vote, the people who are with candidates that don't survive to the second vote, those become the most popular people in the room. In fact, I just edited a story where the Bernie Sanders were, yeah. supporters were chanting to others, come on over, come on over. <laughs> so it is this sort of jovial but serious competition for votes and to try to get people to your side. Absolutely. We were talking to the precinct captains who, who were brought on by each of the campaigns to kind of manage their alignment phases. And they were saying, we want to be the nicest people in the room. We want people to feel comfortable coming over to us. And so as they were kind of negotiating, every time new supporters, just one and two and three people at a time, coming over to Bernie Sanders, coming over to Pete Buttigieg, their supporters would cheer and clap for them as they came over like they were the best people they'd ever seen in their lives. And so it's, it's really... Um, about those personal relationships that these people have formed. You know, you're caucusing with your neighbors, with your community members. These are all people who maybe live in the same apartment building downtown um, talking about politics and talking about who they think is best positioned to lead the country. And we've got, so we've got this very convenient caucus location. There's also a caucus location that we are at called the Hayloft, which is a bar in tiny little Grant, Iowa. Uh, they had antlers on the wall, and it was a whole bunch of people who know each other, know each other well. And so you should go to the Des Moines Register to read about the hayloft and the democracy going down there. We'll be back later this evening. I'm Rachel Stassenberger. Brianne Bonnensteel. Thank you so much.
the hooded captain, the precinct captain for the hooded campaign, can you please uh, come up uh, to the secretary's desk? The precinct captain for the hooded, hooded campaign. <laughs>
patients. Uh, we're, we're having a, a recount. We're on a fractional uh, delegate swing in our math. So uh, uh, we're, we're, we're doing a recount on a couple, a couple uh, stacks of, uh, of cards just to, just to be sure.
20% then. It's continued to go up with each update we've had of his entrance poll. It's at 24 right now. Conversely, 65 plus, the oldest group, that's the group where Sanders is barely registering and Biden is doing very well. That group has dropped all night in these updates. That's now down to 27%. 27, that is lower than where it was in 2016. So you're now starting to see steadily in this entrance poll an electorate that's a little younger, a little younger skewing than it was in 2016, and a decline there now of a point. We'll see if there's more updates in a 65 plus. Steve Karnacki, thank you very much. And Claire McCaskill, to your point earlier, struck by those gender numbers. First of all, it's interesting that we've got a pretty heavily female-skewed demographic in terms of who is turning up. 42% male, 58% female. But among female voters, we're looking at a Buttigieg doing better than anybody else. Yeah, kind of, kind of, kind of a jump ball yeah, I among mean, female voters. I'm They're assuming all very similar. that the section of the pie chart that is not filled in there is everybody, is everybody else. else. Um, so we were looking to see how Klobuchar, for example, would be doing right. female voters. You can't right. break her out uh, from this from this tally. But yeah, that's, I mean, Buttigieg first with female voters, then Sanders, then Warren. Yeah, it's interesting to me, and it shows you that we have not yet figured out how to get all the women to unite behind women candidates. Um, and I'm not sure that's a bad thing because we don't want somebody to vote for a man just because they're a man. We shouldn't vote for a woman just because they're a woman. But there is this aspirational thing among women. That is real. We want to see a woman in the Oval Office someday because we know how many great women are out there that can do a fantastic job. So is it a question of the right woman?
With so many candidates in the race, it's hard to know who's going to make it to November. But the day of reckoning is almost upon us. The upcoming Iowa caucus has more power than you realize. A caucus is a political party meeting held to discuss party issues, elect local party leadership, and vote for preferences in a general election. As the first in the nation, Iowa draws a lot of attention from candidates, and the decisions there are seen as a strong indicator for how a presidential candidate will fare down the line. In fact, past winners of the Democratic Iowa caucuses have gone on to win the nomination seven out of ten times. For both Democrats and Republicans, participants must be 18 years old by the date of the presidential election and be registered registered as a Democrat or Republican by the time the caucus begins. Republican participants simply cast a vote of support either by raising their hand or by secret ballot. Democrats are a bit more complicated. They separate into groups based on candidate support. Each candidate needs 15% of the people in the room to make it to the next stage. That means people will try to persuade attendees to join their groups. After that first tally, some candidates won't have earned 15%. Those candidates will be dropped, and their former supporters can choose to move on to other groups. Then, with the new groups formed, the group sizes will be counted for the final time. Once the presidential preference proceedings are done, the results are reported to the state party, where they will be verified, then reported to the media and the public. People are always asking me, why are the Iowa caucuses so important that they're always first in the presidential nominating season? Well, the thing to remember is the caucuses are not first because they're important. They're important because they're first. So why are the caucuses first? Well, here's a bit of history. Iowa's had caucuses as long as it's been a state, but they moved into the national spotlight in the 1970s. The National Democratic Party was trying to become more inclusive and less driven by party bosses. Iowa Democrats revamped their caucuses to get more people involved, but that brought some complications. Caucuses are essentially precinct meetings that start the process of choosing delegates. But in order to fit precinct meetings into a schedule of county, district, and state conventions, the party needed to start early. The old story is that they figured out how long it would take to print all the paperwork on their elderly mimeograph machine. 
So in 1972, Iowa ended up being first in the nation. None of that would have mattered if the candidates and the media hadn't taken notice, but they did. In the 1972 presidential race, Senator George McGovern's campaign was managed by a young political whiz kid named Gary Hart. Hart noticed that Iowa was going to be first in the nation and decided to make a bid here as a way to get a media boost before the New Hampshire primary. It worked. McGovern came in a close second to Ed Muskie, the establishment favorite, and gained some positive media attention. Gary Hart, by the way, used that strategy himself with good results in his own 1984 presidential campaign. So that set the stage for 1976, when an unknown governor from Georgia decided to use the caucuses as a springboard into the national stage. When Jimmy Carter became president, that cemented the media attention for Iowa as the first test of candidate strength. Today, Iowa caucuses are first in the nation, mainly because the state insists on remaining first. The Republican and Democratic parties in the state actually work together, go figure, along with other early states like New Hampshire, to make sure the caucuses stay first in the nation. Ultimately, ever, however, it's the candidates who keep coming to Iowa and the media who keep coming to cover them who make the caucuses important. I hope that answers some of your questions about the Iowa caucuses and their history. I'm at the Iowa State Fair! Woo! <laughs> Hello, Iowa! Hello, Iowa! Hello, Iowa! Hello, Iowa State Fair! I have this whole riff about health food, and I don't know if this is the place to give that speech. You want the whole truth? Then I'm gonna make a confession right here. I love the Iowa State Fair. Presidential candidates have been coming to the State Fair forever. They do it because, I mean, these days, there's a million people. Um, and there, there are people that you wouldn't necessarily always see at the campaign rallies, people who maybe don't, uh, you know, are ripe to be engaged uh, in a presidential campaign for the very first time. Welcome to the 2019 Des Moines Register Political Soapbox. The very first time we had presidential candidates at the Des Moines Register Soapbox was in the 2003-2004 cycle. It was novel. Uh, the idea behind it was going back in history, big cities used to have street corners where a person would just they'd bring their own soapbox, they would stand on it, and they would try to draw a crowd to talk about whatever it was, the issues of the day. At the very beginning, we just gave the presidential candidates a microphone in 20 minutes. You know, we just tried to let them draw a crowd. You can move around. We have a much more sophisticated setup for the soapbox than we did in the past. The national media comes to it now, so we have to have press risers. We live stream all of the soapbox speeches, which of course was not a feature in 2003. And, uh, you know, I think that the candidates have gotten more sophisticated as well. Uh, they arrange their campaign to bring the crowd in. But the thing that hasn't changed is they can still talk about whatever they want for 20 minutes. For one thing, this is not a place where you give a big policy speech. You don't show up at the state fair to talk about your latest plans to reform the capital gains tax. Uh, you come and talk about Iowa and how great it is. So it's, it's a positive picture. The, you do have to avoid making mistakes. The soapbox that probably actually made the most difference in a pres presidential campaign was Mitt Romney in the 2012 cycle. He was trying to fend off some hecklers. And at one point he uttered the phrase, Cor Corporations are people, my friend. We can raise taxes on, 
Of course they are. That made instant national news. That phrase was used by his opponents to make it look like he was out of touch with common people, and it dogged him throughout the entire campaign. The Iowa State Fair is really cemented in the political tradition for presidential candidates. The pork producers uh, have a gigantic grills, and they always invite candidates. I think I can also flip the And they put on the apron, and they actually help you know flip a few pork chops. The state of Iowa is known for its pork production. We're the leading state when it comes to pork production. And so uh, what better place for candidates to come and you know, get that photo op or, or try their hand flipping chops and mingle with uh, you know, consumers and voters here in the state of Iowa. And it's just sort of clicked. It's right on the midway, so it's easy to get to. Photographers can find it. It's a photo op, and it looks like a quintessential Iowa photo scene. It's always been an opportunity for uh, candidates of all types to interact with people, show how normal they are, and also uh, just kind of have fun and let your hair down a little bit. I'm looking forward to the pork chop on a stick, but then I just learned it's actually the bone, it's not on a, like a wooden stick. Here, I'll let you do my bone. Can you physically do my bone? Yeah. Here you go. Find your bone. Find your bone. Let's see. I do. Come on, I deserve I mean, a vote. I will not ask you to pick up a favorite between the Minnesota State Fair and the Iowa State Fair, but can you name something the Iowa State Fair has over the Minnesota State Fair? Um, well, okay, so you've got a little, I think there's a few more trees here. How do you make the, uh, the, the, the bread? It's a family secret. It's an uncrustable on a stick. <laughs> well, most candidates come to the state fair because a lot of Iowans come. It's a festive celebration. Uh, it's a chance to be seen. It's a good photo opportunity for news photographers. And uh, it's a good time. It's summertime. And, uh, and I think it's just a pl place for a lot of Iowans to be.
also calling in the results over the phone, not using the app because of, uh, of a glitch in the reporting. So it appears that, that the uh, calling in these results is taking more time than the instantaneous app. We do not know if it's more than that. We don't know how widespread it is, but that is what we know here right now as those party officials, those presidential campaign officials, you know, they thought they would be at their victory parties or licking their wounds perhaps. Now they're headed downtown for more to try and find out from party officials what the hold up is. Well, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, uh, give me a sense of the mood that you're seeing out there, Jeff, because there must be a lot of frustration, a lot of awkwardness uh, right now. What's going on with the Iowa Democratic Party? Sure, I mean, like, this is something that, uh, it's central time here, so it does not seem as late. If you will, I talked to one official, he said it's only right before 10 o'clock, and this isn't that late. I said, you know, but the uh, results that we've been talking about all these long have always come in much faster. Uh, in 2008, they certainly did. Uh, four years ago, they certainly did. And it is a different moment. They are reporting significantly different results. Uh, the raw total, of course, the popular vote, if you will, as well as the, the delegate equivalent. But uh, the, the mood of the presidential campaigns is one of worry and one of wonder exactly what's going out there. And some know exactly how they did and how they didn't do. So that is another thing, quite a bit of window here. But I think average voters you know, have already gone home. I was texting with uh, some voters who were at their um, uh, precincts earlier, and they've been home for quite some time. So there is just a sense of, uh, of where are these results. We were talking about newspapers earlier. The deadline for the Des Moines Register, the state's largest newspaper, is about now. It's coming up on 10.30, so the winner almost certainly will not be on that front page. And that does matter. We, of course, um, you know, have seen time and time again Rick Santorum end up being uh, named the winner of the Iowa Republican uh, caucuses a couple weeks later. So we're, we're efforting more information here. We can talk to these officials and the campaign officials once they come out of the uh, We'll come back to you as soon as you have more information. Uh, Jeff, thank you. Uh, Sean Sebastian is joining us right now from Story Party. He's the city secretary out there. What can you tell us about this delay?
caucuses themselves operate independently of presidential politics and really didn't have much to do with presidential politics until, oh, we could say roughly after 1968. After that, then, uh, we, we had this problem of how to nominate a president, really because we had had caucuses and been using caucuses, that, that's what got us in the position where candidates wanted to come ahead of time. One of the effects of 1968 was the rise of what political scientists called independent political entrepreneurs. So instead of the party organization looking for and picking good candidates to be their nominees, increasingly potential candidates decide they, on their own they want to run and they build their own organizations. If you think of building a race car, you need to take it out on track and see how it performs. And where do they try out that race car they're building? They try it out in Iowa because it's relatively inexpensive compared to other states. And the one unintended benefit of, of Iowa is that in fact, candidates have to treat voters, individual voters as real human beings, not simply as campaign props. The 68 effect was to say we have to open up the political process, whether you're talking about caucuses as here in Iowa or primaries across the nation. Uh, that opened up the process, but did a lot of people go through that door? Not actually.
I'm Rachel Stassenberger, the politics editor of the Des Moines Register, here with Brianne Fonnensteel. And it's about 10.30 at night here. Caucusing started at 7 in most places. And what do we know? What do we know? We don't know a whole lot as far as results right now. We're waiting for the Iowa Democratic Party to start reporting these in. One thing that we do know is this is a little bit later than they had told us to be planned for, but we are getting a lot of new results this time that we haven't had in the past. The reporting out the raw alignments from the first alignment, the second alignment, and then, then the traditional state delegate equivalents. So this is more than they've ever done before. They're doing it with a new reporting app, which is brand new. We've heard there have been some glitches on that app throughout the state during the day. It's unclear to what extent that is affecting this delay in the results. Um, so we, we are waiting to hear more from the Iowa Democratic Party. And often it does happen that, you know, after any, any election, you want the results immediately. I mean, it, we've all been in the situation where we've refreshed and refreshed and refreshed and waited and gotten anxious. So far, we are not hearing, and the, the Iowa Democratic Party put out a statement, they're not freaking out yet. Um, and so we're trying not to freak out, but of course we're anxious. We've been waiting, we've been planning for this for more than a year, and it's just taking a little bit longer. I will say that I was reporting from one of the, the larger precincts here in Des Moines, and that, that caucus ended pretty, you know, it took a while. There were, there were a lot of delays. They had a lot of new caucus goers who needed to register. They needed to change their address. They needed to register as Democrats. That delayed the start of the precinct. They had to physically count a thousand people and they had to make sure that that was right so that they could report it out correctly. I ended up back here in the newsroom mm -hmm. as that was ending and there, there were already all of these concerns about the delays in reporting. So these caucuses take a while. They're, these may be just perfectly normal expected delays, but we are starting to, to call around the state to see what's up, um, to see if there is anything more to these delays. And a couple things we've already seen, you know, as Brand mentioned, there are a lot of new caucus goers. The Iowa Democratic Party said they're thinking it's maybe in the 2016 um, turnout results, so not quite hitting that 2008 turnout results. But bear in mind, in both 2016 and 2008, there were fewer Democratic candidates than there are now. There's just a lot more of them, which means even little things like they get to make speeches or their supporters get to make speeches. Well, if there's a, nearly a dozen candidates, supporters who get to make speeches, that just takes a while. And we, uh, we're expecting this to be a late night. We think we're gonna be here for a while, so we will keep an eye on those results and keep reporting them back. So go to the Des Moines Register or USA Today to see what's going on.
it's gonna be a long night, but I'm feeling good. I want to thank you all, all our supporters, and all those incredible people who hold public office in this state that endorsed us, and all the endorsers from all across the country, my colleagues in the Senate, in the House, and from the Vice Presidency, all of you, and all the people from Delaware, California, all the people came from all over to kept campaign here. And most of all, I want to thank the Iowans that are here. Well, the Iowa Democratic Party is working to get this result, uh, get them straight. And I want to make sure they're very careful in their deliberations. And uh, indications are, from our indications, it's going to be close. We're going to walk out of here with uh, our share of delegates. We don't know exactly what it is yet, but we feel good about where we are. And look, so, so it's on in New Hampshire. when that one man is replaced by one very persistent woman. see America from very different viewpoints, and we have since we were born. Trump grew up in New York City in a 23-room, nine-bathroom mansion. I grew up out in Oklahoma in a two-bedroom house with one bathroom and a converted garage where my three brothers slept. By the time he was three, Donald Trump was getting a $200,000 allowance every year from his dad's real estate empire. In total, he got nearly half a billion dollars from his dad. Me, I took on small jobs to make money, babysitting, waitressing, sewing dresses for my aunts. Donald Trump claimed bone spurs to avoid the draft. All three of my older brothers signed up for military service, and the oldest spent five and a half years off and on in combat in Vietnam. Before he became a reality TV host, Donald Trump spent most of his career running one company after another into bankruptcy, stiffing small businesses, ripping off workers, and scamming students. I spent most of my career studying why families go broke and fighting to make it easier for them to get back on their feet. Before I was even elected to office, I built an entire federal agency to stop big banks and financial institutions from cheating people. I tell you this. I love it. But I tell you this because a person's values matter. A president's values matter. And the only thing Donald Trump values is Donald Trump. He believes that government is just one more thing to exploit, a tool to enrich himself and his corrupt buddies at everyone else's expense. I believe government should work for everyone. We don't know all the results tonight, but tonight has already showed that Americans have a deep hunger for big structural change to make our economy and our democracy work for everyone. Tonight showed that our path to victory is to fight hard for the changes Americans are demanding, changes that Democrats, independents, and Republicans are demanding. Tonight showed that our agenda isn't just a progressive agenda. It isn't just a democratic agenda. It's an American agenda. Challenges 
Americans have answered the call. Even when the doubters and critics say that our dreams are too big and the fights are too hard, we persist. In the, 19, in the 1700s, when people said we could never overthrow a king and form a new republic, farmers and merchants came together and fought side by side until we won our independence. In the 1800s, people said that slavery would endure forever and African Americans would never see liberation. But abolitionists, enslaved and formerly enslaved people, formed an underground railroad and more than two million people waged a war to defeat the tyranny of slavery. <laughs> In the 1900s, people said we could never rescue our economy from the depths of the Great Depression or defeat fascism, but we forged a new deal. We mobilized to defeat fascism. We expanded unions. We built a middle class, and we marched for civil rights. <laughs> Americans do big things. That's who we are. We don't back down. We meet big problems with even bigger solutions. So I'm here tonight because I believe that big dreams are still possible in America. Tonight, you showed that when you imagine an America that lives up to its ideals, you can set in motion the process of making it a reality. All it takes is some hard work and better connections. <laughs> and here in Iowa, that's what happened. You came together, you organized, you showed that we are united in our conviction that hope defeats fear, that courage overcomes cynicism. <laughs> We will always be a stronger party and a stronger nation when we unite around our shared values to advance justice and expand opportunity to everyone. So right now, across America, there are folks standing with groups of friends or sitting on the couch with loved ones or maybe even watching this quietly on their phones because everyone else in the house is asleep. <laughs> watching and thinking, maybe I could help out. Yeah. Maybe I could volunteer some time. Yeah. Maybe I could get in the fight. Yeah. And that is how we're going to do this. Yeah. I am here tonight to tell you, if you have hope that America can be better than it has been in these last few years. And if you have the courage to speak out and do a little organizing with us, then this campaign is for you. If you can imagine an America where corruption doesn't block our ability to reduce gun violence, an America where we can urgently tackle climate change, an America where we can bring an end to the opioid epidemic, then this campaign is for you. If you can imagine an economy where every job has dignity, where people are paid a livable wage, and where everyone, everyone, has a real chance to thrive, then this campaign is for you. And if you can imagine a democracy where people, not money, come first, this campaign is for you. And if you can imagine an America of moral clarity, that lives its values every day, then this campaign is for you.
Tonight, we are one step closer to winning the fight for the America we imagine is possible. Tonight is for you. Tonight is for every volunteer who put their feet to the pavement to fight for change. It's for every organizer who braved the blistering cold to knock on doors. It's for every person who made a call or sent a text to spread the word. I'm going to tell you about some of our volunteers, because tonight is for the veteran who came back diagnosed with PTSD and who volunteered every week to help us become a nation that honors its promises to its veterans. Tonight is for every undocumented, unafraid organizer and volunteer <laughs> who proudly knocked on doors to let the world know that the path to progress runs through courage, not fear. Tonight is for the innovative, persistent women who organize babysitting clubs so they could get in more hours of volunteering. And tonight is for the single mother who had been homeless and who was so determined that her twin daughters would grow up in a better world that she found the spare moments to make calls on our behalf. Tonight is for everyone who believes that no matter the color of your skin, who you love, how you worship, where you were born, or what zip code you live in, you should be safe and your opportunities should be pretty much as good as everyone else's. Yep. In every day and every way, this movement is made up of people who know that the only way to make progress and to build power is to fight from the heart. So tonight, Iowa and all of you, I want to say thank you. Thank you for living your values. Thank you for standing together, fighting together, persisting together. You have made me a better candidate, and you will make me a better president. Let me. Let me begin by stating that I imagine, have a strong feeling that at some point, the results will be announced. And when those results are announced, I have a good feeling we're going to be doing very, very well here in Iowa. And the message that Iowa has sent to the nation, it's a message shared by the American people, is that we want a government that represents all of us, not just wealthy campaign contributors and the 1%. Yeah. Tonight, in this enormously consequential 2020 election, the first state in the country has voted, and today, today marks the beginning of the end for Donald Trump. The most dangerous president in modern American history. You know, no matter, no matter what our political views may be, the people of America understand we cannot continue to have a president who is a pathological liar, who is corrupt, who does not understand our Constitution, and is trying to divide our people up based on the color of their skin, based on their religion, 
their sexual orientation or where they were born. And all of that hatred, all of that divisiveness is going to end when together we are in the White House. We are going to win this election because the people of the United States are sick and tired of a massive level of income and wealth inequality. They don't want tax breaks for billionaires and cuts to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. at least 15 bucks an hour. The American people understand that health care is a human right, not a privilege. And that our administration is going to take on the greed and corruption of the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical industry. And whether they like it or not, we will pass a Medicare for all single pay program. The American people understand that in the year 2020, all of our people, regardless of income, are entitled to get a higher education. And that is why, together, we will make public colleges and universities tuition free, and why we will cancel all student debt in America. And we're going to do that through a modest tax on Wall Street speculation. Eleven years ago, we bailed out the crooks on Wall Street. Now it is their time to help the middle class. And unlike the President of the United States, the American people the American people understand that climate change is not a hoax, but is an existential threat to our country and the entire world. They understand that the time is now for us to take on the fossil fuel industry to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energies. And as President of the United States, because this is a global issue, not just an American issue, we are going to speak to the people in China and Russia and countries all over this world and say, maybe, just maybe, instead of spending $1.8 trillion dollars a year on weapons of destruction designed to kill each other, maybe we should pool our resources and fight our common enemy, which is climate change. And the people of America know the time is long overdue for major reforms to a broken and racist criminal justice system. We're going to invest in our young people in jobs and education, not more jails and incarceration. And the American people also understand that our immigration system is broken, and together we will pass comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship. And the American people know that gun safety legislation 
will be written by the American people, not the NRA. And the American people most certainly know that it is women who must control their own bodies, not politicians. So brothers and sisters, yes, Together, we will defeat Donald Trump, but we're going to do more than that. Our message to Wall Street and the insurance companies and the drug companies and the fossil fuel industry and the military industrial complex and the prison industrial complex, our message to them is change is coming. Together, together, together with the strongest grassroots movement this country has ever seen. where we have knocked on hundreds of thousands of doors here in Iowa. We're doing it in New Hampshire. So let me conclude by thanking our great staff, our volunteers here in Iowa. And now it is on to New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina, California, and onward to victory. Thank you all very much. Des Moines, what up? Yes! Y'all, look at all of us in this space right now. No, but really, like, look around you all. I see so many friends and family members in the audience, y'all. This is something that we have done together. Like, really. Y'all, tonight we are going to send a message to the entire country. I could cry and I could get emotional because right now I just want to shout out, since we're in Iowa, I want to shout out all of the organizers on the ground. If y'all are in this space, y'all, we need to show them some love. 
all of our organizers who have been working tirelessly over the last several months, we see you. I know so oftentimes, you know, we bring the national folks out. We're so thankful for everything that you do for this movement. But I know that in Iowa, the reason that we've knocked 500,000 doors is because y'all have been putting in the work. That happened here. And we should be so proud, y'all. I want to thank every person who has volunteered who is not a paid staff member. Come on. Every person who has given up their time and their energy when you could be doing something else. Every volunteer that flew in from other places. Y'all. Y'all done given your vacation days. You're sick time to come because you believe so critically in the mission and the vision of what president, or look, let me claim it, president, okay? <laughs> Senator Bernie Sanders has to say, you all, we don't take that lightly. We know that what we're doing here is groundbreaking. And people often overlook the underdog, just like they've often overlooked Senator Bernie Sanders from the beginning. But what we are showing people is that a little state in the middle of the country, that's often considered a flyover state, that's often considered only white. I see a lot of black and brown folks in here, I'm just saying. We exist, we are out here. What we have shown the entire country is that we like Bernie Sanders and we believe in the vision that he has for this country. So just, you know, from somebody here who got invited to be a part of this movement, I just want to thank you all. Like, because we did this together, and we're doing this together. And we are going to continue until we make Senator Bernie Sanders the next president of the United States. So thank you all. Thank you. Literally, thank you all for everything that you've been doing. Y'all, this is the beginning. These results are going to come in at some point. And in the meantime, we just, yeah, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. So we're just going to be patient, and we're going to wait, and then we're going to claim victory. Y'all ready? Yeah. Iowa, y'all ready? Yes! All right. Thank you all so much. So, so, so much. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. Let's give it up for the Honorable Deanna Langford! Iowa, where you at, baby? Iowa, where you at, baby? Now, I just want to add a little something, something, if I might, on what Sister Langford had to say. Now, Senator Bernard Sanders may be 78 years old, but we about to make him 46. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Hello, somebody. Oh, yeah, number 46. That's what we are going to do, baby. That's what we've been working to do. So as Sister Langford laid out, 500,000 doors knocked on in this great state because of people like you. But I got to bring Ann. It's not a but. Ann, I got another friend. And he hails from the great state of California. One of the national co-chairs, my colleague, Congressman Ro Connor. Let's hear it for Nina Turner, the amazing Nina Turner. Thank you. Thank you to everyone here from Iowa. Thank you to everyone here from across the country. Let's answer a question tonight. You know, when they ask what type of Democrat is Bernie Sanders, or can, or, or can, or can Bernie Sanders win, or can, or can he build a coalition, let me tell you very clearly what type of Democrat Bernie Sanders is. Bernie Sanders is an FDR Democrat. FDR was the most popular Democrat in the history of this country. He built the largest coalition in the history of this country. And that's what all of us are going to do again, to build a Democratic Party that's truly a progressive party. 
a party that stands for health care for all that we've been fighting for for 75 years. A party that stands for the right of everyone to get a good paying job that we've been fighting for for 75 years. A party that stands for every kid getting a decent education, something this party has been fighting for for 75 years. Bernie Sanders is the most Democratic candidate in the race. He's reminding us about what our party has been fighting for since the New Deal. And he knows that we need less war and more peace. He's, he's going to fulfill the ideals that FDR had of international cooperation, reaching out so that we can tackle the greatest threat facing our planet, climate change. And he has a vision. I see the Sunrise Movement here. He has a vision for the Green New Deal that are going to create thousands of jobs, not just in Iowa and across the Midwest and across the country, but is going to help save our planet. And together, we're going to tackle climate change with Bernie Sanders as president. Now, let me tell you why Bernie Sanders is the candidate with all of us that's going to defeat Donald Trump. Who is the candidate who has the most rallies, the most people, the most grassroots energy. And who is it? If Here's a question. If all of the young people in this country, if so many, if over half the young people of all different races, of all different backgrounds, those young people who marched with the Parkland kids to tackle gun violence, those young people who are marching to tackle climate change, those young people for marching to end war, if the young people in this country are telling us that they want Bernie Sanders as president, shouldn't we listen to them? I know this. We have started here, thanks to all of you, a movement in Iowa to reclaim the Democratic Party. We're going to do very well here tonight. Then we're going to go win in New Hampshire. Then we're going to win in Nevada. And we're going to surprise people in South Carolina. All right, Mila. So just in the last couple minutes, a whole bunch of candidates said a whole bunch of things. What they said <laughs> and why. <laughs> so at the end of the night, the candidates are always going to get up. They're going to go to these watch parties where their supporters have gathered, hopefully as a victory party, to cheer them on. And so right now, everything's kind of in, um, in limbo as we're waiting for results. So these candidates, rather than say, you know, thank you for your support, we're going to carry on anyway, or thank you for carrying us to victory, they said, you know, thanks and we'll see what happens basically. And so a lot of them kind of just went right into their stump speeches. We heard Joe Biden talking about restoring the soul of the nation and we heard Bernie Sanders talking about the, you know, the problems of income inequality. And so they took this as another moment to get their message across as we're waiting for these results to come in. And the Iowa Democratic Party just at the, basically at the same time they were all getting on the stage said, look, we found some inconsistencies in the data. This is not hacking. This is not a problem. We're going to work it out. You know, but obviously there's been a lot of attention on the Iowa caucuses, so the delay does make people pretty anxious, as we've told you before. By the way, I'm Rachel Stassenberger, the <laughs> politics editor for the Des Moines Register. And I'm Brianne Fonensteel. I'm the chief politics reporter here at the Register. And we've been covering this stuff for more than a year now, and we hope that we get results soon, but we're just going to have to sit tight. And for that, good night. We'll get back to work. Thank you. And when Bernie Sanders is president, he's going to call up Mark, and together they're going to pass one piece of progressive legislation after another. Let's welcome the progressive chair of the House of Representatives, a big Bernie Sanders supporter, Mark Pocan. Hello, Iowa. Let's give another big thank you to Ro Khanna in just a second. Last week in Congress, we did two really big bills. One, 
was Barbara Lee's bill to repeal the 2002 authorization to go into war. And the other was Ro Khanna's bill to stop any funds to going to any war with Iran. Ro is one of the great leaders for peace and justice in Congress, and let's hear it for him as a chair of the Bernie Sanders campaign. So I'm your neighbor from Wisconsin, uh, and I have had the great pleasure the last few weekends of being here. And I've got to tell you, you guys have done an amazing job. How many people here knocked on doors? How many of you? And that's why this campaign is, I gotta tell you, you guys, this is not about a single individual, although we love Bernie Sanders. This is about a movement, and we will make it back when we take the White House in November. drugs. How many of you are worried that you may not have a planet with an environment for your children or your grandchildren? And how many of you want to make sure we don't have endless wars in this country? I'll tell you, those are the stories we heard. There was a woman in Dubuque who came from my home state to help on the campaign. She was talking about her son who had mental illness and couldn't get access to health care. And because of it, wound up getting incarcerated. Now the good news was while he was incarcerated, he got health care. And he had hepatitis C. Hepatitis C, the cure is 95% effective, but it's $1,000 a pill and you have to take it for 90 days straight. The company that produces that drug made enough money in their first year to pay for the acquisition of the company that made it, and the top five executives' bonuses were enough to cure everyone of Hep C in the United States, Great Britain, Canada, Australia, and one other country. Well, that woman talked about how her son got cured while he was in prison. But when he got released, he had the exact same problem and couldn't get help for his mental health care. And he passed away seven days after getting out of prison. That's the stories that we hear that happen over and over and over and why so many people want to see real change in this country. And that real change happens with Bernie Sanders. So let me just ask this. We're going to have the results at some point, hopefully very, very soon. But we're going to need everyone's help in the coming states. How many of you are willing to keep knocking on doors in other states? We've got to do it in New Hampshire and Nevada and South Carolina. We've got to go on and help row in California. We need our help in Wisconsin. And if we do that, are you ready to win the era? Now, before I start with my brief remarks, as you heard, there was, I think, some technological glitch in transmitting data from one place to the next. But I can tell you right now, if it was a broadband issue, under Pete Buttigieg's plan for rural America, we're going to take care of that rural problem. (laughs) 
So listen, Iowa, it's wonderful to be with you tonight to celebrate this movement that we have across the Hawkeye State and now is about to ripple across America. It's been so invigorating and encouraging watching you here in Iowa assume that important responsibility, a very difficult decision. You took it seriously, and tonight you got the job done. So recently, recently I had an opportunity about three weeks ago to announce my endorsement for the next President of the United States, Pete Buttigieg. And just like you, I took that job, that, responsi that, that responsibility, seriously. In less than a year, we'll have the opportuni opportunity to choose the leader who will make us stronger at home and abroad. I spent three decades in uniform in the Army and the Army Reserve. I currently sit on the House Armed Services Committee. And I know that Pete brings a very deep intellect and experience grounded in his time in a war zone. He understands the global challenges that we face. The lessons he took from Afghanistan shape his understanding of America's role in the world and make him uniquely suited for this moment. Pete will bring that same leadership to make us stronger here at home. For the past eight years, he has stressed and steered a diverse, working-class industrial city into a brighter, more prosperous future. That would be South Bend, wouldn't it? <laughs> South Bend, Indiana. A city that was written off years ago as dying, if not dead, today is striving. It is striving. And you're gonna hear more about that from Gladys Muhammad. But what excites me greatly is that when it comes to advocating for and empowering communities of color, like the ones that I represent in Maryland, Pete made hard-fought progress in South Bend in the African-American community. But he understands that much more work remains and there are no easy solutions to ingrained problems. I can't tell you how proud I am to join you, a movement across Iowa and America, a movement, people who are yearning for change, not that change that is rooted in Washington, but that change that is bubbling up in communities across America. And I'm honored, I'm honored tonight to introduce to you a longtime leader in South Bend. Some call her a, legend, a, a living legend. She's a community leader, a civic activist. And when I asked Gladys Muhammad, well, tell me about the real Pete, she said, well, Pete, he's honest and he's cool. So I present to you, Miss Muhammad. stories would be looking good, looking good. You sure enough looking good. <laughs> good for Pete. I have, my name is Gladys Muhammad and I have 30 years of experience working in the neighborhoods, working with grassroots and grassroots to improve our communities. I have My role was in was coming up with strategies and activities to look to, to engage people in that process to help them make decisions about their own lives in their own communities. To instead of complaining all the time, to come together and help 
do something for yourselves in our neighborhoods. Somewhere along the line, I met Pete Buttigieg. <laughs> and Pete became my friend and my ally in working in the neighborhoods. We looked at issues of crime, drugs, violence, and all kinds of things, neighborhood revitalization, affordable housing, and all kinds of things that happened in neighborhoods all around this country. And Pete was there. I said, hey, Pete, you gonna help me? And he said, yes, I am. I, I did not have to ask twice. People in South Bend and the national press have a narrative to say blacks in South Bend don't support Pete Buttigieg. Here I am, black and proud. <laughs> celebration every year for eight years. This year he missed it, but guess what? We had 971 people at a breakfast. We had 111 tables. Pete is there every year. He just missed this year. But that's because he was uh, campaigning in the Carolinas, a place he needed to be. Yeah. Pete has changed street signs. We have a Martin Luther King Boulevard now running straight through the heart of town, not on a little block in the neighborhood. We have black history programs where people that, who have not been recognized that have had commitments to South Bend, Indiana, Pete has recognized those people. They've been on billboards throughout our city so that we know that African Americans in South Bend contribute to the life and success of our community. Pete Buttigieg did that. A couple years ago, we, Pete and his administration put $4 million into a center on the far west side of town called the Charles Black Recreation Center. I grew up in that center. When I grew up, it was a city dump. And now I'm so proud of that center. It's right there living, look like all the cities, all the community recreation throughout the city, in the neighborhood, and I'm very proud of that. And to be, uh, I didn't come here to disrespect any Democrats running to get in the White House. I came here to support Pete Buttigieg to put the White House. for us to vote for, to occupy that White House. He has the skills, he has the courage, he has the integrity, and to run for that White House and win, and we need all of you to help him win. In the words of Ella Baker from Sweet Honey on the Rock, we, we, he, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it's won. And Pete Buttigieg gonna help us win. When black people do what it is that they have to do, when discrimination is put behind us, we can win all over this country and take the White House back. I wanna introduce you to our candidate, man, our man from South Bend that we blacks do love and we do support. And that is Pete Buttigieg. <laughs>
because tonight an improbable hope became an undeniable reality. So we don't know all the results, <laughs> but we know by the time it's all said and done, Iowa, you have shocked the nation. <laughs> because by all indications, we are going on to New Hampshire victorious. You know, one year ago, it was in the deep freeze of an Iowa January where we began this unlikely journey to win the American presidency. We weren't well known, but we had a new idea. The idea that at this moment when Washington has never felt further from our everyday lives, a middle-class mayor from the American Midwest could carry the voices of the American people all the way to the American capital and make sure they're actually heard. We had the belief that in the face of exhaustion and cynicism and division, in spite of every trampled norm and every poisonous tweet, that a rising majority of Americans was hungry for action and ready for new answers. We could see an American majority yearning for leadership to rally us together behind bold ideas to make a difference in our lives. We saw that Americans were ready to come together, but our politics were not. To seize this moment, we needed a new path forward, a path that welcomed people instead of pushing them away, brought them together instead of driving them apart, because this is our best and maybe our last shot. We knew that with this American majority, we are on the cusp of changing the game for ordinary Americans. But that we could not win or govern if we wrote people off who didn't agree with us 100% of the time. But that if we could come together, the future that we know is possible would start on January 21st, 2021. An awful lot of skeptics who said, not now, not this time. All this talk of belonging and of bridging divides is too naive, too risky. So tonight, I say with a heart full of gratitude, Iowa, you have proved those skeptics wrong. And it was by your effort we brought together an extraordinary coalition of Americans, 
progressives, moderates, and that good number of what we like to call future former Republicans. And that's how we're going to win in November. Because it's about adding people to our cause, adding to our majority. That is how we will guarantee that on the day Donald Trump leaves office, we'll be ready to move America forward into the era that must come next. I want to thank every member of our campaign family, every organizer, every volunteer, every caucus goer who talked to a neighbor or a coworker, every staff member and every supporter who believed. And anyone who shares our vision can join the three quarters of a million grassroots supporters fueling our movement and ship in right now at PeteForAmerica.com. recognize a few other people who helped us get to this night. My mother, who not only helped raise me, but put her love of language to work, answering letters sent to our campaign. My father, who left us just in the very early days of this journey, but whose own journey to this country made tonight possible in the first place. And to the love of my life, keeping my feet on the ground. I want to congratulate my fellow Democratic competitors in this diverse and formidable field. For months, we have been having an honest and respectful but vigorous debate about the course of our party and the future of this nation. And tonight, Iowa chose a new path. From river to river, in churches and community centers and high school gyms, you joined your neighbors to say that the time has come to turn the page and open up a new chapter in the American story. You chose to move on not just from the broken policies of these last few years, but the broken politics that got us here. And tomorrow, because of what we did here, the nation will have that choice, too. We take our message onward to New Hampshire, which has a way of making up its own mind, to Nevada, to South Carolina, and beyond to every corner of America. And as we do, we will be building the movement that not only will win the election against Donald Trump, but win the era for our shared values. We have exactly one shot to defeat Donald Trump. And we're not going to do it by overreaching. We're not going to do it by division. 
We're not going to do it by saying it's my way or the highway. This is our shot, our only shot to galvanize an American majority to win. And make no mistake, ours is the campaign that will defeat this president. A president who cuts taxes for corporations while crushing the rights of workers to organize ought to have to compete with a middle-class mayor who entered politics fighting for auto workers and actually lives and works in the industrial Midwest. A president who tries to cloak himself and his wrongdoing in religion should have to debate a candidate not afraid to remind America that God does not belong to a political party. And a president who avoided serving when it was his turn should have to stand next to a veteran ready to show what troops deserve from a real commander-in-chief. Now, this president may get a pass on the floor of the Senate, but this November, the verdict will be up to us. And when I am your nominee, we will win big enough to send not just Donald Trump's presidency, but Trumpism itself into the dustbin of history where it belongs. Something is stirring in America right now. You can feel it. We saw it tonight in the bluest counties and the reddest, in rural towns and industrial cities, in big communities and small, and the suburbs in between. We're seeing Democrats hungry to win, independent voters who had been turned off by our politics, Republicans tired of trying to look their kids in the eye and explain this presidency, all standing together and all standing together to declare that we are defined not by who we voted for in the past, but by what we're voting for in the future. This is the coalition that no pundit saw coming. And it's the coalition the president won't see coming either. It's a majority we're assembling to agree not just on who we're against, but on what we are for. We are unifying a rising American majority, ready to raise wages and empower workers in this fast-changing economy. A majority ready and determined to put an end to endless war. A majority committed to bringing about a day in America where your race has no bearing on your health, your wealth, your access to education, or your relationship with law enforcement. A majority of Americans ready to support our teachers with a president and a Secretary of Education who believe in public education. These, those Americans are counting on us to come together and act, and they cannot wait. I've met Americans not even yet old enough to vote, but who know that we cannot wait an 11-year-old asking how his family will be able to afford the insulin he needs. He can't wait for a president who will ensure there is no such thing as an uninsured American or an unaffordable prescription.
The 14-year-old who let me know she's already written out a basic will because she's terrified the next day in school could be her last. Cannot wait for a president who will see to it that she can walk into her school free of fear. The 10-year-old who let me know he expects to be around in 2100 and look back at whether we acted fast enough to secure his future. He cannot wait for a president prepared to enlist every American in the fight for our climate. We are running for them. This campaign is giving voice to them, and it has room for everyone. Because no matter who you voted for in elections past, and for that matter, no matter who you caucused for tonight, we welcome you in our campaign, and you belong in the future that we are building for America. Whether you're a young woman with autism in Muscatine or a veteran battling addiction in Claremont, you belong. Whether you clean hotel rooms in Las Vegas or are getting a new business up and running in Charleston, you belong. I believe the presidency has a purpose. And the purpose of our American presidency is not the glorification of the president, it is the unification and the empowerment to the American people to solve these big problems. America has a place for everyone. And I believe this not because of my age, but because of my experience. I believe in American unity because of my experience serving, of lacing up my boots in the dust of a war zone alongside Americans so different we hardly had anything in common besides a flag on our shoulders, yet learned to trust each other with our lives. Thank you. Thank you. I believe in American boldness because of my experience governing, guiding a city once called dying out of the shadows of our empty factories and into a brighter future. And I believe in American belonging because of an experience you are part of right here tonight. Looking out at you and remembering how it felt to be an Indiana teenager, wondering if he would ever belong in this world. Wondering if something deep inside him meant that he would forever be an outsider, that he might never wear the uniform, never be accepted, never even know love. And now that same person, is standing in front of you, a mayor, a veteran, happily married, and one step closer to becoming the next president of the United States. is the America we are building. That is the America so many Iowans chose tonight. If you are ready to build an American life defined by belonging, this is our chance. If you're ready to build an American politics defined by boldness, this is our chance. And if you are ready to build an American future defined by unity, in the face of our greatest challenges, this is our chance. So with hope in our hearts and fire in our bellies, we're going on to New Hampshire, on to the nomination, and on to chart a new course for this country that we love. Thank you.